like to welcome you to the second annual Graham Trust Symposium. Um, this is, uh, I mean, uh, Wes Graham, I think you, mo many of you know, is, uh, was one of the, the, the fathers of computing in, um, in, at the University of Waterloo. He was uh, one of the first professors of computer science and uh, the director of the first in, um, university computing center. Um, this was in the late 1960s. In, in West Graham in 1965 with Jim Mitchell, Paul Dirksen, Jim Welch, Ian McPhee, Don Cowan, and others, um, a number of whom are here, um, created Watt4. And I think of a certain age, Watt4 and its, its successors were the way that one learned computer science in Canada and around the world. And it came from this group, in, from this place, from some of the people in this room. And I think we still see in Waterloo the legacy of some of the work that was done here and then. And now I'm very proud to say that in 2019, um, the West Graham Trust is sponsoring um, two pro um, uh, research fellowships. Um, we're about to see the speakers and, uh, and, a, and a research postdoc. Um, and we'll be talking about some of the great work that they have been doing over the, past, um, over the past year. And I will introduce them and say all the great work that got them to this place. But it, it is, it is uh, particularly nice to see some of the awards and some of the developments that have happened over the past year because I think it's very directly been enabled by the, the contribution and the support of the West Graham Foundation. So I think we should probably clap for that. I heard it, I heard it. <laughs> just because this, is, this has been, a, I think, a, a great investment by, by the West Graham um, Trust in, in, in providing this, uh, this support. Now with that, I would like to introduce a Dean of the Faculty of Mathematics, Stephen Watt, to welcome us to the, welcome us to the day. And perhaps I'll say after, either he or I will say something about the structure of the entire day, I think. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, thank you to all for coming out to uh, kick off this really exciting day. Uh, as Mark had indicated, there are many parts to the day. Uh, this is, the timing is around convocation, one of the uh, most uh, important days of the academic year, where our graduates are, where our graduates are, are uh, symbolically completing their degrees. They've already passed all their exams some time ago, and, and going out into the world. Um, Wes Graham has had a, uh, a very important role in the formation of the Faculty of Mathematics in the way that it looks today. Um, the, the contributions of, the, of Wes Graham and some of the people in this room to kicking off the University of Waterloo's reputation has been fundamental. And the ongoing support from the Graham Trust has also fundamental to the School of Computer Science. We're fortunate to have computer science as part of mathematics here at the University of Waterloo. Com computer science sits in many different places at different universities. Sometimes it's a faculty, sometimes it's a department in engineering or in science or whatever. But computer science is no longer about where you put the transistors. It's about where you put the information, how you handle it. And so we're very happy and it's a very natural fit within the faculty of mathematics. And the integration between computer science and mathematics, I think we see in work every day in this school. We're very grateful for the way in which computer science has been launched with the vision of Wes Graham and colleagues who are here in the room. And so welcome to the day today. And with that, I would like to hand things over to Ian McVie, who'll speak on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Graham Trust. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, following Wes Graham's untimely death in 1999, at age 67, Don Cowan approached me with the idea of forming the Graham Trust uh, to honor Wes's memory and uh, with an endowment, found, uh, endowment fund that would continue to fund new initiatives uh, that were consistent with Wes's value, values uh, and passions uh, for students, education, computing, and innovation. A number of Wes's colleagues uh, who benefited financially from entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ventures with him uh, contributed generously to the trust. 
And some of these colleagues were also directors of the Waterloo Foundation for the Advancement of Computing, known as WATFAC. And they decided uh, to wind up WATFAC at that time, too, and contribute its assets to the trust. Uh, so the, uh, today, uh, the Graham Trust Endowment has over $7 million invested, and uh, its income is used uh, to fund uh, important initiatives to continue Wes's legacy of innovation in education and computing. David Johnston was president uh, when the trust was formed, and he embraced the opportunity of the Graham Trust to kickstart new initiatives uh, and he per participated personally in, his, in its formation and its formative stages, uh, never missing a meeting until he left to become governor general. Uh, the trustees favor projects that need seed funding to demonstrate viability to attract ongoing funding. Uh, an early example was the trust's support for CMC's uh, first summer computing camps exclusively for young women who had previously been intimidated by the male adolescent behavior uh, from coming to the regular uh, computing camps in the summer. And uh, so these, these female-only uh, camps were a great success, attracting young women from all 10 provinces and the Northern Territories. Uh, and after a few years of funding by the Graham Trust uh, and the success that was achieved, the, the computing camp uh, for women attracted corporate funding that continues to sustain this important Waterloo outreach program. The trustees also favor uh, projects that encourage interfaculty collaboration for initiatives that require uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, expertise. One such area was the emerging field of health informatics, uh, which needed collaboration between math, computer science, and applied health sciences. Uh, since 2004, the Trust has helped Water to establish its leadership position in health informatics uh, by the funding of five chairs and three fellowships. So this morning we're pleased to have the opportunity to hear presentations by the three current fellows on, their, on the latest uh, important work in this field. Thank you, Ian. So in the, in the spirit of interdisciplinary, in the, in the spirit of interdisciplinarity, um, we, we, uh, we, have, we built these, the, the fellowships, um, both for, for faculty and for postdocs, around the notion of health informatics and bioinformatics and AI, and chose two inaugural fellows in Jesse Hoy and Bin Ma, um, who are doing work precisely in this area. Now I want to put my glasses on because there are actually some details here that are that are worth worth, worth mentioning. Um, Ian mentioned interdisciplinarity. Um, Jesse Hoy is a, an associate professor in, in the Cheriton School of Computer Science, where he leads the the computational computational health informatics lab. Chill. I should just go with the acronym and work backwards. Um, he's also a, an adjunct scientist at the Toronto Rehab Institute in Toronto. Um, he has a degree bachelor's degree in physics, master's degree in oceanography, and he does have a PhD in computer science, so we, we're, we're, we're good. Um, <laughs> you know, and a PhD in philosophy, and anyway, no. Um, what does say that? But anyway, so, uh, but Jesse works on problems in computational social, social science, probabilistic decision making, automatic reasoning, effective computing, which is a field he has sort of pioneered, and a number of other uh, re sort of related things. Many of this has applications towards working with um, patients with disabilities, patients with Alzheimer's. If you ever get a chance to tour his lab, um, there are, he has a, a full sort of a, um, kitchen that allows you to go in and interact with, a, with an entity <laughs> that will guide you through things that we think of as simple, but for somebody with a cognitive impairment are actually very difficult. Um, but, back to interdisciplinary, that, and th this truly is an interdisciplinary field, in, I think to, to, to the effects of the, the fellowship and the teaching uh, reduction and the, um, the um, research uh, support it provides, um, Jesse was the um, recipient of the 2019 Outstanding Research Comp Contribution in Social Psychology. And so this is something, this is an award given out by the um, by the um, 
uh, you, the social psycho um, the American uh, Sociological Association, which is a very large and uh, prestigious organization uh, for um, for works that have had impact over the past years. And um, he teamed up with a Professor Robert Freeland, at the so, uh, um, a sociologist at Wake Forest University, to conduct novel research at the intersection of computer science and social psychology. And I think today he will speak to some of this work. This is very recent work. The, the award was announced in the last couple of months. And I'm very pleased that Jesse will be able to speak to some of this work right now. Your mic already? Yeah, I think so. Well, thanks, Mark, for uh, now you've exposed me as a completely confused academic. I don't know where I am, uh, which field I'm supposed to be in, but uh, I am going to talk to you today about uh, some of the very recent work that I've done in trying to understand uh, identity in Alzheimer's disease. And the, the main objective of this is to try to help us build technologies that will help people that are uh, dealing with this uh, disability. Um, so for those of you, many of you may already know what Alzheimer's is, but it's a disease that uh, robs people of their short-term memory. Um, it makes it very difficult for people in later stages of the, of the disease to carry out basic tasks of their everyday life, like washing their hands or dressing or making a meal. Um, and they're often helped by, uh, or they need to be helped by a, another person um, that can be a formal caregiver in a long-term care facility type setting, and often it is uh, by a family member in their, in their home if they're trying to age uh, at home. Um, and you can see these statistics. I mean, d uh, Alzheimer's and uh, related dementias is a, is a growing problem because of our aging population. Um, but these ones here about the uh, amount of hours of unpaid care by family members are quite remarkable. It means that there's an enormous amount of work going into dealing with this cognitive disability uh, of these older adults, and this problem is growing uh, drastically as, we, uh, as the population ages. Um, and so our, my sort of objective for uh, many years now, although less years than it took the, the St. Louis Blues to win the Stanley Cup, um, <laughs> that was to uh, try to design pieces of technology that are gonna help people with Alzheimer's disease to carry out these tasks in their home without the need for a human caregiver to be there assisting them. Okay, so this is something that is aimed at trying to help relieve the burden both on the human caregiver that's there so that they can carry on with their lives, but also make the person who is de uh, dealing with this um, disability able to uh, interact with their world more independently. Um, so that's been our sort of objective for, for quite a few years. And what I'll do now is I'm going to show you a little cartoon vignette. So this is something we created a little while ago just to get across the basic idea of what we'd like to be able to create. So I'm going to show you this little scenario. This will sort of set the stage, and then I'm going to talk a bit about what are the issues involved in trying to make something like this a reality. I think this is running. There we go. Dinner will be ready soon, Dad. Do you want to go wash up? Oh. Now, what was I supposed to do here? Oh. Hi, Bill. Did you want to wash your hands? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Thanks. Bill, get the soap. What was that? Get the soap. I'm not sure what you mean. Bill, can you please pick up the soap now? Oh. 
there it is. Great job, Bill. Now wash your hands. Okay. Thank you. Are you done washing up, Dad? Dinner's ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming, dear. <sighs> yep. Okay, so that's just a little vignette to show you what the ideally what we would like to what we would like to be able to create. So, if we think about what are the issues involved in trying to build a piece of technology that can do this, there's really three basic components in my view. The first one, and I'm really going to talk about only one of these here today. The first one is a functional component. So this system is going to have to, you know, be able to monitor this person as they're trying to do something. It's going to have to figure out what are they trying to do. This guy, he's trying to wash his hands. It's going to have to know when they go off track, when he can't remember what the soap looks like. He can't remember what, if he's supposed to use soap. And then it has to be able to actually intervene in this person's life by maybe playing a prompt like you saw over the speakers saying, uh, you know, time to use the soap now. Um, so that piece is something that we believe we can basically accomplish. So we've spent a lot of time trying to build these kinds of systems using cameras and other kinds of sensors in order to solve this problem. Um, there's a collaborative aspect to this in, there's another aspect of the research where we try to understand the whole social network that's involved in this person's life. So it's not just one person with a caregiver, there's other family members involved, there's uh, medical professionals, um, and there's beyond that the, 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 policy, the policies involved at the governmental level, etc. So that piece is important. The piece that I want to talk about today is an alignment piece. So the person with Alzheimer's disease has difficulty figuring out who, what the context is. So they forget where they are, right? And if they're then suddenly prompted by this strange voice, then this throws, that can easily throw them off. And we believe that this is because there's an emotional misalignment between them and the piece of technology, okay? This is a very common problem with technology and something that designers work for many hours at trying to solve in trying to build pieces of technology that are natural to use. So you feel, on an emotional level, you feel aligned with this piece of technology. So this is the piece that I really want to talk about today. Um, and so I'll give you a flavor of, of how we're going to do this. Essentially, I want to go beyond these functional abilities of these devices, and we want to start thinking about who is this person? Who do they think they are? How are they feeling about themselves? How are they feeling about the caregiver, the system, the task itself? Uh, and then how this assistive technology is going to affect them emotionally. So really we want to build a set of technology that's emotionally aligned and this, the idea is that this is going to help with the uptake of these systems and the, the long-term adoption, right? We believe that if this piece isn't done right, then people will throw these technologies away and not use them. Okay, so let's get through a little example. This is a, a, a resident uh, at a long-term care facility here down in Kitchener. Um, and uh, we uh, spoke with this gentleman uh, you know, during some of the interviews that I'll talk about a little later, and uh, he, in his, in his life, in his bio biographical experience, was a lawyer, right? So he was a fairly successful lawyer, and what happens in Alzheimer's disease is that the person can't figure out from the context, including the people that are in that context, what role they should be playing, okay? So this gentleman had different roles. He was a father, he was a husband, he was a lawyer. But when somebody comes in like this staff member and starts to interact with him, he can't place this person. He doesn't know who they are, and so he's gonna select one of these roles to play. Maybe he's gonna say that he's a lawyer. So he'll come in to the staff member and say, I need to give you some legal advice now, right? And the staff members, the professionals that have been there and interacted with this guy for a while are really good at nailing it. They say, okay, he's in his lawyer mode right now, so I'll behave like a client, right? Oh yes, I really need that legal advice, and let's, while you're giving it to me, we can clean your hands up or something like that, right? And these kinds of interactions only work because they're emotionally aligned. If he was thinking that he was the father and this was his daughter, it wouldn't work to behave like a lawyer's client, right? 
So the caregivers are really good at, the, the staff members are really good at figuring this out on the fly very quickly. Can we build a technology that will do the same thing? Okay? It's got to somehow figure out, is this person, what mode are they in right now, and how can I adjust the automated system so that it actually interacts with the person according to that mode? All right, so I use a, uh, a sociological theory called affect control theory, which is, has a computational implementation that I've worked on extensively. And this uh, little piece of uh, theory, the idea is this is gonna help us build these systems that are able to maintain this kind of emotional alignment. So I'm just gonna give you a very brief introduction to this. Essentially, the theory says that people uh, have sentiments or feelings about things in the world and these feelings exist in a fairly low dimensional continuous space. In fact, three dimensions are enough to account for a large amount of the variance in, of, the, of the, uh, the sentiments that people feel. And there's one of evaluation, one dimension of evaluation, so things can be good to bad. Uh, one of potency, so things can be powerful uh, or weak. And one of activity, so things can be really active or really inactive. And then, so people, we carry around these fundamental sentiments that are shared amongst people in a common cultural group. And then when we see things happening in the world, social actions, they create what are called transient impressions. Those are other feelings. And these are the feelings that happen about seeing something in context, all right? The theory says that people try to experience events that confirm these fundamental sentiments. So essentially, people look for consistency on an emotional level in the world, all right? So we try to make this happen, and the way humans do it is we either actually take action in the world, we do something to help this along, or we adjust our internal representations, our internal interpretations of the situation in order to make it more consistent. Uh, it's explained in this nice little book by David Heiss, who's really the, uh, the pioneer of this theory. And uh, I've done an, a, a lot of work in trying to unify this with some of the more traditional decision theoretic uh, reasoning models in artificial intelligence and specifically using uh, Markov decision processes. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna tell you about three studies that we've done just recently in order to try to uh, sort of populate this theory with real data that is going to help us build these technologies that are emotionally aligned. So the first one was a uh, qualitative study. We did a semi set of semi-structured interviews with uh, 33 residents and 20 caregivers, and we tried to ask the question, well, can we actually get information about people's biographical identities that we can then put into a system that would use this? Remember, we're trying to figure out, is this guy a lawyer or is he a, a father right now, right? Uh, we wanted to also know about their current identities. This person also has a, knows that he's a patient or you know, some kind of a patient in a long-term care facility. And then we wanted to study the loss of identity and we also wanted to see how would they react to something like this, a virtual human that would be prompting them in order to uh, carry out one of these tasks. Uh, this was developed by our colleagues at the University of Colorado at Boulder. The take home message from this study was that we found that while it's true that people with Alzheimer's disease uh, can't remember who they're supposed to be, they can remember how they're supposed to feel, okay? So there's this emotional component in the brain which is preserved while the, a large part of the more deliberative uh, aspects of the brain are, are attacked by this disease. So for example, this guy who's a father, a husband, and a lawyer, he, all of those things together create what's called his persona, right? He is all of those things at once. Now he goes into this disease and he can't remember who he's supposed to be in a specific situation, but he remembers how it's supposed to feel. So he sees somebody and he thinks, maybe this is my legal client, I'll treat her like that, right? If she responds, by just acting as his daughter, that may push him to respond as her father, okay? And so it's sometimes very difficult to do this for people dealing with the disease because they feel emotionally targeted themselves, okay? Um, okay, so the basic idea is that they remember how they should feel but not who they are. 
Right, the second study that I'll tell you about is we said, well, now we have to understand how do people, will they interpret a system who is, that is prompting them in some way? Uh, and we decided to sort of simplify this problem and just see how do people react when they see personas online. And this is like any picture of anybody, including that virtual human. And we looked at a related problem, which is that of memory supplement sellers. Okay, so if you haven't seen memory supplements, you go to Google, type in memory supplements, Alzheimer's disease, and you'll see a whole range of pages of people selling, you know, uh, uh, roots that they've gathered in the, in, the, in the jungle somewhere in Bolivia that are supposed to help you with your memory, right? Uh, in my view, most of these things, uh, these people are snake oil salesmen, they're selling placebo, uh, and they're targeting people that are emotionally very, uh, in a bad state, and so they end up buying these things and, and believing that they're gonna help with their memory. Uh, so I'm showing you three of them here. Uh, you can maybe get a feel for what the identities of these different sellers are. This one's got a kind of a mystical, spiritual look to him, and this is a classic sort of doctor-looking guy, and here's this rugged mountain man who's up you know, in the jungles of Bolivia finding these roots that are gonna help you with your... And so our, our idea was to say, well, can we get people to uh, tell us how they would react to these different types of identities online, and then we can get a feel for, can we control for that in some way, right? Could we see this guy and know that that's really not gonna work with this particular person, and therefore we should go with something that looks more like this, okay, in this virtual human. Okay, so what we did is we created an artificial, uh, a memory booster, and then we showed it to them and asked them for a baseline, would you purchase this product? Then we showed them one of these snake oil salesmen, and, uh, and they would read the little biography that's all taken from their website, and uh, this is Dr. Dharma, and uh, then we'd ask, would you purchase the product from this guy? And then we asked them to rate this guy on these three axes of emotional identity, evaluation, potency, and activity. They also rated themselves on those three dimensions, and then we tried to see whether we could use these ratings in order to predict whether they would purchase this product or not. So we did find some significant correlations. Uh, one was between the, the distance in this three-dimensional space between how they rated themselves and how they rated the seller, and we found that as this distance increased, their purchase tendency decreased. So this you can sort of understand that people tend to trust other people that are sort of similar to them, right? So somebody who's really different, you'd be like, mm, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, when we looked at affect control theory, we computed this deflection, which is this distance, this measure of inconsistency, and we found that surprisingly, the purchase tendency increased as this inconsistency increased. So we're still trying to figure out exactly why this is, but our current hypothesis is that in situations of high deflection, people tend to uh, stop using this emotional reasoning engine because it's not working anymore, and then they fall into more deliberative, rational thought, okay? And then this creates, since they uh, have all sorts of information coming in, they will then tend to, like, it looks like they will tend to opt for buying the product more. So this is something that is well known in marketing and advertising, uh, that it works if you distract people, then they will tend to go for it rather than, uh, rather than not. So we think that that may be what's going on here. Okay, the third study I wanted to tell you about is one that just happened last week. So the, uh, the Mujan Gafurian was uh, down in Cleveland doing a set of interviews with uh, professional caregivers. And our objective here was to tackle this problem of people that don't know how to do this alignment or haven't figured it out yet. And this can be family members or it can be new staff members at a long-term care facility, right? So they are trying to interact with somebody. This person is behaving in ways that they don't understand. And our objective was, so for example, in this case, the lawyer-client situation, this is actually his daughter and the daughter feels confused by the fact that the, her father is treating her like a legal client, right? So she's behaving as if it's her father, but there's a breakdown on this emotional level. 
So what we'd like to do is create an app that they can use in order to uh, understand this idea of this emotional breakdown and maybe give them suggestions about what are appropriate ways of handling this particular person. Maybe you want to try pretending you're this legal client instead, right? Something like that. Um, so Mujan was down in Cleveland last week at the Avon Oaks Caring Community and she carried out nine sessions with 18 professional staff, uh, did two focus groups and seven co-design sessions. And the focus groups basically revealed a lot of the stuff that we found just through talking to caregivers informally. Um, so uh, one of them was that uh, staff learn through trial and error. So this quote is a good one. It says, I think that, uh, that the app would help people in the community because a lot of people, especially when they are new, even after they are new for a while, they don't know how to talk to the people, right? The people here being the residents, people with uh, dementia. Um, so this quote is good because it shows that even she actually knows that new staff members come in and it takes them a long time to get to the point where they can nail this emotional uh, alignment problem with every resident that they're handling. Um, and they talked a lot about role playing. So here's a quote, there are 30 residents and you live in 30 different realities in a matter of 24 hours, so you have to figure out which one you are in, right? So for every single resident, they have to do this separately, right? So it's a very challenging problem. And this is just a little one about what, one specific example. We had a lady we called grandma, but she would call us granny and I would, I would play like the granny role and say, grandma, come on, I have made this for you. And then she like, trust me, okay? So that's just a little example. Uh, so Mujan then carried out these co-design sessions or what this should this app look like and what kinds of functionalities should it have uh, with these nice little paper prototypes so people were able to sort of move things around and express what they thought. These are the professional caregivers, what they would like. So this, we really tried to take a, a very participatory uh, approach to this rather than sort of building something and giving it to them. We're like, what could this look like? And then uh, my USRA student, Derek, who's up in the back, on the fly created this app uh, and Mujan was able to then go and present it to them uh, to show them uh, what it could actually look like. He created this really nice little app where you can select a resident, then you can select different activities that he might be doing, and then it would give you suggestions of how you could interact with this person. Uh, so Bob uh, most likely thinks he's your boss be respectful and say, please eat your food, and then they can provide feedback, this worked or didn't work, and then that goes back into the system so it can learn about these different people and these different identities. Okay, so the key questions are, uh, what kind of affective identities are held by people with Alzheimer's disease? How, how do they change? Can we track them over time? Can we uh, actually prompt them in a way that's effective? using this effect of this emotional alignment. Uh, can we use something like these virtual humans? Can we tailor those so that they will work in these situations? Uh, and also the timing of prompts is a big deal. Uh, so in general, how can the modeling of sentiments and emotions lead to more acceptable adaptive technologies for, for assistance? Um, so I've worked with a lot of people on these problems and these are all my current students and. Uh, postdocs who are, many of them are helping with this kind of research. And I've received a lot of generous funding from the American Alzheimer's Association and I would like to thank the Graham Trust for their generous support of this and support of my uh, research over the last uh, uh, couple of years. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse. I do think we have time for a couple of uh, short questions if there are any. I'll, I'll bring this up to you, Robin. Um, I would think that uh, one of the roles that everybody has experienced in their life is patient doctor. So, I mean, uh, the person in your example would have at some point in his life been a patient going to a doctor. So, yeah. did you deliberately stay away from that identification? Because I think all of us, when we're in that scenario, we kind of act slightly differently and so on. Maybe we're less emotionally connected, but it is a role we've played. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a great question. We did uh, study their sort of current identities, the things that they are living right in the moment. Um, but they would, 
uh, and, and certainly a lot of the caregivers would, would take that on, right? But it, that role of being a patient, unfortunately, is a, is a very weak role, right? So you're in a state of great, your, your potency, or your, you, you're in a state of weakness when you're a patient, right? Um, and that creates an emotional disturbance in people. They feel helpless, right? So I, and, and my understanding is that for the, from a caregiving perspective, that's something that you want to avoid and then they would try to sort of move away from that, right? That implication might help to understand why you got the results you did, because they need something that expresses something that they got a sense from an authority. Oh, I see. You're right. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? So you talked about the correlation between deflection and purchasing power. Mm. Uh, so can you explain more on the deflection point? Yeah, so it's, it's still a little, uh, we're still uncertain about it, so we're trying to design another experiment to delve into it a little deeper. But the basic idea is that people in an, in, if you're in a consi an emotionally consistent situation, you don't have to think, you just do, right? It just comes naturally, you just go with the flow, you don't have to think about what you're doing. If you're in an emotionally inconsistent situation, then you're forced into thinking about what you're doing. And for some reason in this case, that's causing people to say that they would purchase this product more, right? So the, the reason that it's increasing their purchase tendency, we're still not too clear on, but the idea that it has an effect is, is probably because of that. So this, that, this technique is used in marketing. It's also used in management. There's management styles that are very disruptive and the idea is to force people to stop just going with the flow, and they will try to, uh, you know, actually think about, well, what am I doing here, and how can I make this better? So it's a fairly, yeah, we think that's the effect we're seeing. But are there any other questions? How far away is it from like application? Like to be a real life application? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean, we, we thought we'd be there by now, and uh, we'd, we're definitely not. So the problem is much more, much more difficult than we thought when we first started working on it 15, 20 years ago or something. Um, but certainly at the level of, uh, at this level, we think we're within a year of, you know, within the, this year we'll be developing these kinds of apps that we hope can help human beings in solving the problem, right? So giving them hints, giving them suggestions, things that, that might work. So it's not a fully automated assistant, but it's something that is using the same ideas in order to provide that kind of information. So. Okay, with, okay I think <laughs> generating lots of questions, which is a good thing. Hi. Um, I don't know if the, the personas that you presented on the slide were just a sample of the ones that you selected, but I noticed that they were all, even the guy in the turban was a white male. Right. Um, so I'm wondering about the racial and gender diversity of the personas that you investigated and also the racial and gender diversity of the patients that you base this data on. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. So we did have a selection criteria for the website. So we, we put in, I think it was a Google search for memory supplements. Um, and uh, we, uh, like for instance, they do tend to be all white males for some reason. So we had trouble finding, we had one female um, as one of the identities, I didn't didn't show her there, um, but yeah, it's it's a, that's a I, 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 we can't couldn't really avoid it in some way because that's what these memory supplement sellers are. So. Why would you avoid it if you have to randomly pick one? Uh, that's yeah yeah that's it's it basically because we wanted it to have this realistic. I mean, the idea behind that was to then put it into this social networking application that I didn't talk about here, but as a way of uh, you know, the, the idea there was to create something that's like a filter online that would warn you if you're sort of entering into something that where you would be duped. Uh, according to the, your personality, this is like the kind of personality that you're going to fall for, right? But that was the idea. So it, we really wanted them to be real, uh, real characters online. And those, real, those, those are real websites, and people are buying this stuff, and it, it does, it disrupts things massively, right? So. Yeah, but and the gender, di the racial or gender diversity of the clients. I think we had equal numbers of males and females. The people that were carrying out the 
the survey, but the uh, a racial diversity, I'm not sure about. I have to look it up. I think we have time for one more quick question. So besides caregiving, what other like fields do you think that um, an adaptive AI like this could be used in another person's daily life for the future? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, working on a number of different projects that are trying to implement it in the same way. I mean, I think that in general, sort of uh, dealing with uh, virtual assistance in your own life, so you know, now we're in these situations where we can call for help and, uh, you know, Alexa, turn on the coffee machine and whatever. Uh, those kinds of situations, we want to move towards them where you really feel like you have that connection with your virtual assistant, right? Because we believe that there'll be, uh, there, there's a number of different benefits to it. One is just people will enjoy using it more, but the other one is that the system will work better, right? Because it'll be more tailored exactly for what you are looking for. Um, so we think that this emotional alignment thing could be a really important uh, component of that, right? Just even something as simple as recognizing what somebody's saying, if you know what emotional state they're in, that can give you a, an advantage in getting it right, right? So, that answer your question? Okay, I think with that, I'm, I mean, giving time signals, so I, th I think we're gonna have to thank Jesse here and move on, but that okay. was a wonderful talk, so thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jesse. I think has been made clear by both Jesse's presentation and a number okay, of the, the questions is that this is a, um, this, this research takes time and it also draws from um, many different backgrounds. And what that means to a new academic is that uh, they need time to gain experience and to gain experience in different er areas and also time to put together projects that will have a meaningful impact. So one of the impacts of the, of the Graham Trust uh, in, through its uh, um, postdoc has been to allow somebody who has graduated with, a, um, a PH, with only a PhD to actually build the, the network and build the connections and build the, the, the knowledge base to, to, pursue, to pursue research in this area. So our, uh, our next speaker is the inaugural West Graham postdoc in, uh, um, through the, the Graham Trust Foundation. She, she's Jesse Hoy's um, postdoc. Uh, I present to you Mujan Gafurian. Um, she's had also a great year, as you see from some of the, um, the research that's, uh, that's, that's been discussed by Jesse and will be discussed by Mujan. Um, she has a, um, she got her PhD in, from um, uh, Penn State, I think two years ago, is that correct? Um, but I noticed that I was, I was sitting there reading your CV and I noticed that you've been doing this for a long time because even in your, in your bachelor's thesis you were looking at assistive technology. So you have been doing this for a long time. You're continuing to expand your breadth. And in the past year you've had some, um, um, some work that you're going to talk about now that was actually mentioned in the ACM Tech News, which is a very high level uh, um, you know, impact of, of the work. So I present Mujan to give a next talk. Thank you. Thank you, for Mark, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to first thank the Graham Trust for this scholarship. During the past year, I've been able to work on multiple projects and have developed new collaborations. I've been working on the VIP and Emotech projects that Jesse uh, mentioned earlier with the goal of developing an app that can facilitate interactions of new staff members in care centers or people with, uh, or caregivers or family members of people with dementia. Uh, with the person with dementia. And also I've been working on the Emotech project with the goal of understanding how different identities affect people's trust. I will start a new project with Dr. Kirsten Dottenhoff from uh, the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department where we are utilizing social robots for the care of people with dementia. Uh, we have recently received the Network for Aging Research Catalyst Grant and we are understanding how different uh, social robots are perceived by people with dementia and how we can uh, develop an assistive robot that can successfully help them with activities of daily living. Also in line with my previous research uh, on timing and time perception that I presented during last year's symposium, I'm working with Dr. Uh, C.B. Samuel from the System Engineering, uh, System, Engineering uh, System Design Engineering Department to develop a feedback-based system that can be used inside the cars and by drivers to manage their time perception and impatience 
when they're facing traffic delays uh, with the goal of reducing accidents and improving driving behavior. And I've been working with Dr. Jim Boger on the Care Aid project, uh, which aims to provide family caregivers of people with dementia with the resource to find information faster and find the high quality information that they're looking for. So all of these technologies and similar systems um, are built with the goal of improving people's quality of life, but the key aspect of being su successful for them is for people to actually want to adopt them and use them, or in other words, to cooperate with them. Uh, so I'm going to present this work that we have done uh, where we ask how emotions affect perception of humanness of the virtual agents and if that can affect how much people enjoy interacting with that system uh, or uh, their cooperation with the virtual agents. Uh, we took this definition of humanness from Haslam who uh, says that the humanness traits can be divided into two dimensions, human uniqueness and human nature traits. The human uniqueness traits are those that distinguish us from animals. For example, civility, refinement, morality, rationality, maturity, as opposed to lack of culture, coarseness, immorality, irrationality, or childlikeness. And the human nature traits are those that distinguish us from machines, which are depth, openness, emotionality, individuality, warmth, uh, as opposed to uh, inertness, coldness, rigidity, passivity, and superficiality. Uh, so we argue that most of the technology are moving to be more human-like on the human uniqueness traits by being more moral, more rational, more refined, uh, but there's less effort to make them more human-like on the human nature traits. Uh, and with the emotionality being one of the human nature traits, uh, we hypothesize in this research that a virtual agent that is capable of showing proper emotions would be perceived more human-like, and we uh, hypothesize that that can affect uh, improving interactions and cooperation with the system. So to say that we use this game, we developed this game, and uh, the virtual agent Aria, um, actually we call her Aria, is originally developed by the Interactive Assistance Lab at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, it was used to train people with cognitive disabilities uh, with understanding emotional cues. Um, here in the game, which is a prisoner's dilemma-like game, participants are playing against Aria, who is the opponent, and both players have a shared pile of coins on the right, from which at, this, at each round of the game they should decide Either they want to cooperate by giving the other person two coins or defect by taking one coin for themselves. And the ARIA has also the same choice. After they make their choices, we ask them to choose their emotions from this list of emotions below. And we tell them that you can see ARIA, but she cannot see you, and it is important that she knows how you feel. Um, so participants have to choose their emotion accordingly. On the left, you can see two piles of coins. These are the coins that the participant has earned so far, and these are the coins that Aria has received so far. So, so I'm going to show you actually a few examples of different situations that may happen. Uh, for example, when the participant cooperates or defects, and you can see the coins moving to each pile, so that shows whether uh, each have cooperated or defected. I'm just full of hope. That was great. So in the first round, uh, in the second round, the participant is defecting. I am shocked and baffled. I really thought I could count on you. <laughs> so again, participant is defecting. I am startled. Are you upset? Now Aria is in really bad mood. She will defect the next time, you will see. I did that because I was feeling disdainful. <laughs> so the participant is back at cooperating. 
Thoughtful and very kind of you. Well, are we both in a cheerful mood? So this is an example of a few rounds of the game. Uh, participants played 25 rounds of this game, but because knowing the end of the game would affect their strategies, uh, we didn't tell them how many rounds they're playing. So we recruited 117 participants on Mechanical Turk and assigned them randomly to the three conditions that we had. Two of them were the baselines. The emotionless condition, um, in the emotionless condition, Aria showed no emotions and played the tit for two cast strategy. In the random condition, Aria just showed random emotions, which was randomly selected from those set of emotions, and also played the tit for two cast strategy. And OCC, um, in the OCC, uh, the OCC agent was actually developed based on the OCC model of emotions, and uh, the ARIA's actions and emotions were selected from, uh, based on this model, I will explain later. Um, after uh, playing 25 rounds of this game, we also asked participants to answer a set of questions. We measured how much they enjoyed interacting with ARIA. Uh, we asked them to evaluate ARIA on all those different humanness traits that I showed you, both humanness nature dimension and human uniqueness dimension. And also we asked them to complete the IDAC questionnaire, which uh, measures the general tendency to anthropomorphize and that can affect uh, perception of humanness in general. So to show an example of how OCC works, uh, based on OCC, our emotions are as a balanced reaction to consequences of events, actions of agents or aspects of objects. And if we look at one of the examples for the consequence of events, uh, if the consequence of one event is pleasing for us, if we are pleased, and if we focus on the consequence for other, and it is also desirable for the, for the other, then the predicted emotion is to be happy for that person. Uh, so if I give Aria two and Aria gives me two, I'm pleased by the result, the consequence is positive for Aria as well, so I will be happy for Aria. However, if we go back and the consequence of event is not pleasing for me if I'm displeased, but the, it is desirable still for the other person, I may feel resentment. So in case that I decide to cooperate by giving Aria two and she gives me one, then I will have no coins, Aria will have three. I'm not pleased, I'm displeased, but Aria, uh, it's desirable for Aria. So resentment is one emotion that is predicted. So for each uh, different state of the game, we define these sets of emotions. Uh, for example, if in the last round of the game, the player has defected by taking one, but in this round, um, he decides to cooperate and show a positive emotion, but Aria decides to defect. Then these, this is a set of all the different emotions that can be predicted based on whether um, the Aria is focusing on herself or the consequence for the other, for example, she will sh uh, feel shame because the other person has cooperated, but she has defected. Uh, she will feel gratitude. Uh, looking into future, she will have hope. She will be relieved because the participant is back at cooperating. Uh, however, if the participant uh, has cooperated before but suddenly defects this time and also has no regret, then uh, resentment happens. There is distress, there is anger. Looking in the future, Aria will have fear, will be disappointed. And uh, what I'm showing in the middle is just based on the tree I showed earlier. And uh, also actions were decided according to the coping strategies in the OCC model, which led to a tit for two tats strategy. And that's why we chose tit for two tats for the other conditions. So all the, in all the conditions, the strategy is identical, but the emotions are different. Now let's take a look at the results. Um, OCC model as hypothesis was perceived to be significantly more human-like. Uh, it was perceived to be significantly more human nature-like uh, uh, compared to the motionless. And interestingly, uh, we may think that showing random emotion is better than showing no emotion, 
but showing random emotion actually uh, negatively affected the random condition, made it look seem more animal-like, uh, probably by making the agent look more uh, immature or more irrational. Also, if we look at the enjoyment, participants enjoyed playing against the OCC agent uh, who was capable of showing proper emotions uh, significantly more than the other conditions. And one interesting observation was that uh, only the human nature traits affected enjoyment. And we did not observe an effect of human uniqueness uh, on how much participants enjoyed playing against uh, the agent. So this also emphasizes on the importance of human nature traits and, for example, emotions, if we want people to actually enjoy interacting with our system. Uh, lastly, we looked at the cooperation results and uh, also ARIA improved cooperation. People tended to cooperate more with ARIA, uh, which is good, can suggest that emotions can improve people's trust. And there were two other interesting observations, actually. Uh, one of them was that the general, general anthropomorphism tendency negatively affected cooperation. So the more people see uh, the objects or agents human-like, the less they tend to cooperate with it. And we believe that what we observed was very similar to an uncanny valley effect, and the agent was so human-like that they started to dislike it and not trust it. And the other uh, effect was the effect of age. Uh, as age increased, um, the agent was perceived significantly more human-like on the human nature trait, and this is also reasonable to expect because younger adults are exposed to all different characters and avatars in the games and may have a higher expectation from uh, these agents as opposed to older adults. So to conclude, the OCC agent uh, that was capable of showing proper emotions improved perception of humanness on both human uniqueness and human nature respects, and it also improved cooperation and enjoyment of interacting with the system. Um, we show that any expression of emotion may improve a perception of human nature traits a bit, but uh, random emotions are actually negatively affected perception of human uniqueness aspect, uh, which makes it a good idea to not have emotions as opposed to the random emotions. And also we, all, we again argue that while per perception of the human uniqueness trait can be successfully uh, improved by making systems more rational, uh, more moral, uh, it is important to work on the human nature aspect if we want people to actually enjoy interacting with the system or trust the system. Also, uh, we made a longer version of this article available on archive, and uh, in a short period of time, it uh, attracted some attention, some very interesting headlines. Uh, what can psychopaths teach of us about AI or the strange way robots interact with psychopaths? Uh, of course, we are not going to cooperate with psychopaths or we are not training psychopaths, mm -hmm. <laughs> but this was a very interesting point of view. And uh, I want to actually conclude my talk by opening this question that whether you think it would be good to improve human nature uh, traits of agents and robots because that can be useful in many contexts such as uh, assistive technology or is it not a good idea because machines should stay machines, robots should stay robots? And I'm always interested to hear both points of view. Thank you. Thank you, Majun. Is there, are there any questions? I'll come to your second row. Yes, sir. I have a question about the age related. Like, if you could go a little bit, I'm old and I'm just wondering. Uh, so we saw that uh, on the human nature traits, uh, those that involve uh, emotionality, openness, um, individuality, on those aspects, uh, as age increased, people perceive this agent to be more human-like. And I think it's, oh, the age range was uh, between 18 and uh, 70, I believe.
Yeah, I was, I was uh, my question is sort of about whether the humans in your experiment are always uh, telling you honest answers or not. So um, you had all those little uh, smiley faces and such on the screen. Was it just that you were choosing them to um, uh, get the virtual agent's emotions intact? You weren't asking the users to choose one to tell you how they were feeling. Is that true? Yes. Because I think that if you did that, um, some of them might choose one that didn't really affect their true emotions. You, you're asking them questions afterwards, and there, there should sort of be honest answers, but I think the whole annoyance with virtual agents in general is really going to come in the picture, and, and people are, are actually um, going to have a lot of negative emotion from the interactions, and I think you're going to have to deal with that. Yes, that's a, a great question, actually. Uh, so the question was uh, if people have been honest with us about their emotions or not, because this can affect Aria's reactions as well. Actually, it can affect Aria's reactions only in the OCC model. In the other ones, uh, there's no emotional random emotions. Um, so we emphasize in the instructions that this is important. Uh, actually, the instructions was given by Aria, not us. So Aria was talking to them saying that uh, I would like to know about your emotions because you, ha you can see me, but I can't see you, so please be honest with me. And we did some sanity checks looking at some of the responses to um, see whether the uh, responses are reasonable or not. But of course, it's a good concern. And uh, we didn't go through all the emotions to check if they were uh, correct or not. But if they negatively affected people, then uh, that would be also showing that uh, already OCC model has improved uh, perception of human nature aspects. And if it was doing better, if people have given it more accurate answers, then it would ha there would have been even more improvement. Time for one quick question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if uh, like recently I've noticed uh, using general adversarial networks, people have made uh, images come alive. So it looks like, uh, like a image of a real human being, and it has now become kind of alive. So I was wondering if that could improve virtual assistant system and improve the empathy of uh, the patients. Uh, so if I understood correctly, the question is whether having a picture that is very similar to humans already affected humanness. Uh, yes, that can affect uh, perception of humanness, uh, but like this would be the same for all of the conditions and we are comparing between conditions, so that would affect perception of humanness for all of them similarly. So thank you very much. I have to say I found Aria sufficiently terrifying right al already. <laughs> so <laughs> coming, making Aria come further alive sort of scares me. Anyway, uh, I'd like to thank Majun again for a, a lovely talk and uh, congratulate her on uh, being the first uh, postdoc, uh, Graham Trust postdoctoral fellow. Thank you. So congratulations. <laughs> we, we do have a, a gift for you. So you. congratulations. So our, our, our final uh, speaker this morning is, is Professor Bin Ma in the David Sheraton School of Computer Science. He's one of the leaders in, bi in the bioinformatics research groups in the school. Um, he, uh, aside from, he won the, um, the Premier's Research Excellence Award in 2003, started early, a Premier's Catalyst Award in 2009, um, Canadian Asso Can Association of Computer Science Outstanding Young Investigator in uh, 2010. He was a Canada Research Chair. Um, I don't have the precise dates in the early 2000s. Um, he is also one of the inaugural um, uh, uh, Graham Trust Fellows, faculty fellows. Um, and uh, in the past year, um, Bin received a $500,000 grant from, from Genome Canada, which was then subsequently matched to be nearly a million dollars um, uh, for uh, software for peptide identification and qualification from large mass spectrometry using data-dependent uh, acquisition. Uh, Bin was also, is also a, an entrepreneur. He was the founder and serves as chief uh, technology officer of Waterloo's 
one of, one of Waterloo's most successful startups, uh, Bioinformatics Inc. Um, he's now the president and co-founder of another company, Rapid Novor, another U University of Waterloo spin-off company. So the tradition that I think was started in the time of uh, the, uh, in the 60s with Watfor has continued. And uh, I present to you Bin Ma. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to uh, have this uh, opportunity to share some of my research uh, with uh, my colleagues and uh, Graham uh, trustees. Uh, so I, uh, my research span in the area of computation, uh, bioinformatics, also biology, uh, you know, patient treatment. Uh, that's, uh, that's my talk today. Uh, so it covers uh, uh, quite many uh, different topics from different areas. So I'd like to give a, a very brief overview of the, of the talk so won't, you won't get lost during my talk. Uh, so I talk about this particular disease called multiple myeloma. Uh, it is a type of cancer. Uh, I'll give more details later. And we try to detect the relapse of multiple myeloma patients after the treatment as early as possible. Uh, so we try, we don't detect the cancer cell itself because the cancer stays in the bone marrow, which is difficult to access. Instead, we detect a, a protein molecule that is produced by the, by the cancer cells. Uh, so this kind of, uh, you know, different de detection of the product of, uh, of the cancer is called a biomarker. So we are de detecting a protein biomarker. And uh, we do that, there are different ways to detect that. We do this by a method called protein sequencing, which is a way to read out the primary structure information about that protein molecule. And this is the way to, to detect the biomarker. And uh, we conduct the protein sequencing using a technology that's called mass spectrometry. This is a new method to produce a larger amount of information about that molecule. Uh, but we need a computation to interpret the data produced by mass spectrometry in order to get the sequence of information. So that's the overall uh, uh, story. So we use mass spectrometry to do protein sequencing as a way to detect the protein biomarker produced by the cancer. So that is a way to detect the cancer relapse. So it's, it's a big story. I'll try to do that, uh, compress this in 20 minutes. And this is, uh, multiple myeloma is only one of the diseases that we want to tackle. So this is the first one because it's the easiest to handle uh, for this technology. So we, uh, the, but uh, down, down the road, we will be able to use the same technology, same idea to tackle other diseases as well. That's something I want to uh, summarize at the end as well. So uh, this is a continuous work. Uh, I mean, for many, many years, so, so some, uh, I give a talk last year uh, at this sim symposium, so you will find some overlaps, uh, but to make the story complete, so there are some, uh, there will be some overlaps uh, 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 together with last year. So, so multiple myeloma is a type of a blood cancer, uh, but the cancer is growing in the bone marrow because our bone marrow produces the cancer, uh, the, the blood cells, right? So, so it it's, uh, affects more senior people. So the median diagnosis age is in the 60s, depending on different sources. This uh, age is slightly different. Uh, worldwide, there are 14, 140,000 annual uh, patients that are newly diagnosed every year. And uh, so in over the world, there are over 100,000 deaths related to multiple myeloma every year. So these numbers in Canada is 3,000 new diagnoses and uh, uh, 1,500 uh, deaths uh, in Canada as well. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a relatively rare disease, but it, it's not rare, uh, I'll explain later. And uh, so, so, well, you can see the difference, 3,000 new diagnoses and uh, 1,500 you know, deaths. Uh, so the difference, you know, because of the two reasons, one is that uh, uh, so, so there will be more and more patients living with multiple myeloma, right? So, and also the other is that, uh, so these uh, people are developing very effective treatment to the multiple myeloma. So patients live longer, so they die of other reasons uh, rather than the, ca than the cancer itself. Um, so as I said, multiple myeloma can be treated very well. Uh, in Canada, uh, so every year there are only 3,000 diagnoses, but there are 13,000 patients living with multiple myeloma in Canada. Uh, so, but the, can the cancer, uh, even if it can be treated well, it will eventually relapse. This relapse is the biggest problem for multiple myeloma. Uh, for that reason, in Canada, every patient after treatment, uh, no matter how good the treatment is, uh, the, the patient is always put in this uh, maintenance uh, treatment. That costs uh, about $80,000 per year per patient. And if you multiply that number with the number of patients in Canada, so that costs the public health uh, over a billion dollars every year. And every patient, uh, because it will relapse, every patient is 
uh, followed up with this uh, checkup uh, you know, very frequently to detect the relapse as early as possible so that you can uh, treat the patient uh, very uh, early so the outcome will be better. Uh, so, and the, you know, it's, a, it's a rare disease, but in terms of dollar value, it is not. Uh, in 2017, uh, the major multimodular drugs uh, sale in this world is uh, over $14 billion. Uh, to compare, you know, for a much larger disease that breast cancer, the drug sales is only $17 million, uh, billion. So that's, uh, uh, it's a major, major uh, uh, disease in terms of dollar value. So, uh, so our focus is on the early detection of the relapse. Um, so how do we de detect relapse at this moment? Uh, there are basically two ways. One is actually to detect the cancer cell itself. So as I said, this cancer grew in the bone marrow. So you need to do the bi biopsy to take the cancer out. As I <laughs> happen to have this uh, biopsy needle. So it's a very thick needle that uh, uh, you have to insert uh, this needle into the bone, dig a hole into the bone in order to take some of the marrow out. So it's a kind of painful uh, procedure. Uh, the good thing about this procedure is that it's very sensitive. So it takes the cancer cell directly. The bad thing is that it's invasive. You cannot do that very frequently to the patients, especially these are more, uh, more elderly patients. Uh, so, uh, and also there is a big problem with this, uh, this diagnosis is the, the sample bias. So, uh, when the cancer is gone, you are detecting the relapse. Right? So when there are only small amount of the cancer cells in the bone marrow, uh, the position you dig that hole uh, becomes very important. So that's, uh, you can have a sample bias, you can have false negatives you, if you dig the hole in different location. Uh, so the other uh, path is to do the blood test. Uh, so, uh, so, where, so you detect the a protein that is produced by the cancer but circulating in the blood. So that protein is called M protein, okay? Uh, so, uh, so this method, uh, the good thing is it's non-invasive, it's just a blood test, uh, and there's no sample bias because blood is a uniform liquid in our body, so no matter where you take it, it's the same. Um, so um, this M protein, unfortunately, it is, looks very similar to a normal protein in our blood, so that's <coughs> called a, a polychronal antibody. Uh, so when this M protein level is low, it's buried in the background noise of the normal antibodies. So you won't be able to detect it anymore if the M protein is, uh, is below, the, below the background noise. So this is very insensitive. So that's, that's the bad news. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, if, if, you know, if I ask, ask the patient, you know, what, which method do you choose, right? So, uh, so the doctors would prefer this method because it's, it's actually very sensitive, very accurate, but the patients you know, probably want to, uh, don't want the uh, bone marrow uh, biopsy. Uh, so this kind of detecting M protein from the blood, de not detecting the cancer itself, but, but instead of a product of the uh, cancer, it's the biomarker, right? So the best uh, method would be combining the two. You, know, you want a very sensitive method, but also you want to do it non-invasive. You want to detect that in the blood. And that is the method that we are working on. We try to develop this method. Okay. Uh, so how does it work? So this M protein, although it looks very similar to the, to the antibodies in the blood, so it's similar to other proteins in the blood, uh, but it's, you know, every protein is different in their primary structure, in their sequence, right? So a protein is just like a chain of beads where every bead has a, have a different letter on it. Right? So there are only 26 letters, but for protein, there are only 20 letters. So that's the protein sequencing to read out this sequence. And this sequence is unique for every different uh, protein. So, uh, for the M protein, it turns, all the M protein have the same sequence you know, for that same cancer. So if we can read out that sequence, that's called protein sequencing, we can use that sequence to distinguish the M protein from the other antibodies in the blood. So that uh, gives us the specificity to detect the, uh, detect the protein produced by myeloma. So we actually uh, try to sequence it first, and once we get the sequence, we will find out a unique segment, unique part of that protein and they design this uh, targeted assay for mass spectrometry to specifically target the signal produced by that M protein instead of the other uh, background noise. So that actually excludes all the background noise. Uh, so you won't have the interference from the other uh, proteins you know, from the blood. So this allows us to detect the M protein very specifically and very sensitively. So that is the, uh, the overall uh, technology path that we are following. But the key is actually to get that sequence. That's, that's actually a very difficult problem. 
So, so don't be confused by, confused by the protein sequencing and DNA sequencing. You probably have heard about DNA sequencing a lot. You know, this, today the DNA sequencing is very easy now, so you can do that very quickly. So this DNA sequencing, uh, well, in the left is a DNA molecule, it's a double helix structure. Uh, you, you know, the right hand side is a protein molecule, it's a much more complex structure. It's, you know, it's a chain of uh, beads, but it's folded in a very complex, complicated uh, three-dimensional structure. The DNA is the genetic, uh, well, is the, the molecule that carries the genetic information. This is like a bl blueprint of a building, but the protein is actual f molecule that function, that is produced by the information uh, using DNA. Uh, so this is like the actual building itself, right? So, so for DNA, uh, so the sequencing method was first invented in 1977 by San the Sanger sequencing method. Uh, uh, so in 2000, that is used to sequence the com first uh, human genome completely, that took you know, 14 years of time and uh, $3 billion overall, right? So, and, uh, but then people invented the next generation sequencing to speed up this sequencing process. Today you can sequence one human genome with a few thousand dollars in one or two days. So that's the, the DNA sequencing advanced significantly. But for protein, uh, it's very difficult to read out the uh, sequence information. So the first uh, invention of the protein sequencing method, a very low throughput, uh, but it's still, uh, it's much earlier than DNA sequencing, that in 1950, you already have this uh, Edelman sequencing method for proteins, uh, but it progressed very slowly. So in 2000, people started to use mass spectrometry to sequence the proteins. Actually, I was one of the early participants of you know, developing this technology to sequence proteins from using mass spectrometry, and have been doing that uh, since then. And uh, today, uh, this Edelman sequence, the old, uh, very slow, we are still in use, uh, but is being replaced by mass spectrometry. So as of today, uh, so, so we have the, the, the world's most high throughput uh, facility to sequence proteins. We are able to sequence three proteins every day. So that's a protein is much shorter compared to the genome, right? So there are, there are thousands of proteins on the genome. So you can see that the protein is, uh, sequencing is a very difficult problem, very challenging. But you know, solving that problem is very useful. That's what we are working on. Uh, so I want to explain briefly how we do this. Uh, we do this with uh, a technology called mass spectrometry. This is a mass spectrometer in the middle. That's a picture. Uh, it's a very expensive machine that costs a million dollars a piece. Um, so uh, what you do is that, you know, what that this mass spectrometer can do is just uh, measure the molecular weight. You have a mixture of molecules, like A, B, C, and uh, you put it in the mass spectrometer, it will give you a uh, a uh, mass spectrum like this. Right? So you have three molecules, different types of molecules. You have three peaks, signal peaks in the spectrum. Each corresponds to one molecule. The x-axis uh, is actually the molecular weight of that molecule. It's just like the mass or the molecular weight. Okay. So with that information, you know, we will utilize this very simple, well, very basic machine to sequence the, the proteins. How do we do that? Uh, suppose you have a very short piece of protein, we call it a peptide. You know, it's a protein, but very short, you know, only 20 amino acids or so. Uh, so this is a very short one uh, called peptide. We get many, many copies of the same peptide and fragment that uh, randomly on the backbone, uh, you get you know, prefixes and the suffixes of that string, right? So, so each of the fragment have a unique uh, molecular weight, right? So those mixture of the fragment when you measure that with the mass spectrometer, it gives you a spectrum like that. X-axis, you know, every peak corresponds to one fragment, and x-axis is the molecular weight. So, so these uh, different sequences, you know, because every letter will have a different molecular weight, so the different uh, sequences of a peptide will give you different fragments and give you a different spectrum. So in theory, you actually can figure out what the sequence is from this spectrum. If, if Every, you know, the spectrum is of high quality, okay? So this problem of converting the spectrum back to the sequence is called the novel sequencing, right? So you actually can formulate this problem into a very computational, computatorial optimization problem, right? So you, you first define a similarity between a sequ arbitrary sequence to this, uh, to this spectrum by some formula, and then your goal, optimization goal, is to compute a computatorial string that actually match this spectrum the best with the highest score, right? So that's a very typical computatorial optimization problem. And because of that, 
it has attracted a significant number of computer scientists to work on this problem. It's a pure algorithm problem now. And so, so in, the, in the history, there have been numerous uh, the, uh, the normal sequence algorithms and software published. Uh, among them, I'll explain uh, FSS2 that I, I circled. You know, so in 2003, I published, uh, my group published this PIC software. Uh, that is the first uh, the Nova sequence software that becomes really widely adopted by the, by the community. So this, but today, uh, this is actually still the most popular software for the Nova peptide sequencing uh, used widely in the industry. Uh, so uh, in 2015, uh, I published another software called Nova that you know, does the Nova sequencing much faster. And this is the first uh, the Nova sequence software that utilizes the machine learning to improve the scoring function to improve the, the, the accuracy to a significantly new level. Okay. So there's, uh, you can see that uh, University of Waterloo has been participating in the uh, revolution for the protein sequencing field. Um, so despite the, the significant efforts from the whole community, so this uh, peptide sequencing or protein sequencing actually is still very, very low. You know, even reading a short piece of a protein, only the peptide. So for average quality spectrum, uh, so the accuracy of this uh, peptide sequencing in terms of the lighter level is only 50 to 70 percent accuracy, depending on how you test your performance. You, know, you choose the testing data differently, that accuracy will be different. But that's the range. You can see the er error rate is very high. Right? So, so the source of the errors, uh, scoring function can be a problem. Right? So if you have an inaccurate scoring function, your algorithm will optimize to the wrong goal. So that's a very big problem. And, uh, so even if you have a perfect scoring function, you may not be able to design a very efficient algorithm to find the optimal solution. So you search in a uh, subspace, you get a suboptimal uh, uh, solution. So the algorithm is a problem too. And uh, so despite of these two problems, so that can be solved by machine learning to improve the scoring function, can be solved by designing more efficient algorithm and uh, you know, by you know, spending more longer time to do the search. Uh, so there is a, also another fundamental problem is the spectrum quality. So it's not every single protein, every single peptide will produce a good, uh, good quality spectrum. When the spectrum quality is low, you just simply don't have enough information in the spectrum to figure out the sequence. So there will be errors uh, from that spectrum quality. Uh, that's, that's not doable, not solvable by computing itself. Okay? So the solutions to this problem to address the error uh, of course, we need to improve the scoring function and, uh, and the algorithm, uh, but improving the data quality is a significant part you know, to do this, uh, to solve this problem completely. And, uh, you know, and also, there, before we, pr we are able to produce a perfect quality spectrum for every single peptide, and there is also, we should start making use of the partially corrected sequences as well, so that can uh, can solve this problem as well, to start to use this, uh, make this technology useful already. So now I'll explain the, you know, how we sequence a very short piece of a peptide, okay, it's only 20 to 30 uh, letters uh, length. But how do we sequence a long protein? The protein is as long as 500 to 1,000 uh, letters. Uh, how do we sequence that? So the idea is also um, simple, it's uh, similar to you know, what you do to the DNA sequencing. Uh, we have a long protein, and what we do, we cut this protein into pieces at different locations using different uh, chemical reactions. We use the enzyme, different enzymes to cut the protein into different pieces. And then you actually produce overlapping peptides, okay, every short piece and overlapping each other. So if, in the ideal case, we can read out the sequence of every short piece very accurately, we can use the overlap between the pieces to assemble those pieces back to a long, a long sequence. A, a long, this is like you have, a, you have a long string and you cut it into random substrings and then you overlap them to find the longest common substring. Right? So, so the problem here, well the idea is simple and that's indeed how it works, but the difficulty, the challenge is that every short piece will have errors. Okay? So the error rate is actually very high, it's as, as high as 50%. So how do you detect the overlap uh, despite of the errors? So that becomes an essential problem. And the second, second part is that even after you find, figure out the overlap and you know, assemble every read together into a short long string, you still have errors in every short piece. But by overlapping everything together, you know, for every letter of the protein, you are covered by multiple peptides. Right? So hopefully, you, if you take a consensus, you actually can do the error correction to find the actual 
uh, correct letter despite that every input has errors in it. So that's the main idea of a sequencing along protein. So, 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 so this is the actual screenshot of the software on a real uh, data set. You know, on the top is the sequence of the protein. That is the actual protein uh, we sequenced. And uh, at bottom, uh, every you know, bar with different color that indicates a peptide that we read out from the mass spectrometry data. You can see that for every letter from the protein, it's covered by tens or even hundreds of different peptides that overlap uh, together. Uh, so all of them provide information to the correctness of, the, of that amino acid, of that letter. So if we, if we combine all of the peptides together, uh, although it has errors, if, as long as you know, the errors don't, are inconsistent, right? So errors are kind of random and the correct uh, letters you know, stand out if you take the consensus. That's how it works. Um, so, so making it work on one protein is one story, but what we want to achieve is actually high throughput sequencing of all the proteins, right? So, uh, at this moment, we have the highest throughput in the world to sequence proteins. We can sequence three a day. Uh, so this is about 10 times more than anybody else in this world. Uh, but still, this is not good enough. If we look at only this single application of detecting multiple myeloma, uh, so in US, there are 30,000 new patients diagnosed every year. So we need to sequence 30,000 proteins. Right? So, so that requires to sequence almost as many as 100 proteins per day. Um, so we, are, we can only do three per day now. So, so in order to, we have improved the throughput uh, significantly over the past few years, and we are continually improving it. You know, so the, idea, the, the main point to improve this uh, throughput, first make it a routine uh, for the experimental part. You don't want to go back to repeat the experiment, uh, or you don't want a different experiment for each different protein. Right? You want to make it a routine. And automation is the key. You know, so the, soft, the interpretation of the data need to be automated. Uh, and uh, you know, so to make that work, you know, we need to build in the redundancy. Right? So we do six digest. Uh, if one of them fails, you know, so the other five, we still provide enough information uh, to sequence the protein. And also quality control is the biggest issue here. So, so whenever there is error, your quality control system should detect that error immediately. Uh, so this uh, involves a lot of machine learning. So for machine learning, uh, we don't develop machine learning algorithm ourselves. We just use the off-the-shelf uh, product uh, for machine learning. But what we do is actually create the data. You know, this is more important than the algorithm itself in this application. Uh, so far, we have sequenced 900 proteins. This is by far the largest data set in this world uh, to, for the training of our algorithms. So apply that back to the multiple myeloma. Uh, so basically, at diagnosis, the myeloma uh, protein level is very high. We sequence the you know, protein sequence and then design this personalized uh, assay to target that, that protein. And then after the patient is treated, uh, so the M protein level becomes very low, right? So, so conventional method won't detect that. But because our assay is targeted to that protein alone, it won't be interfered by the other background proteins. So we will still be able to uh, track the M protein level uh, in the patients. So that's the uh, so that's the M protein level is an indicator of the tumor uh, burden yeah, in the patient. And we did that uh, you know, over the past year. We have been doing the real patient uh, samples. Uh, we did that. You know, this is a one test case. Uh, so we uh, used the historical uh, blood samples of a patient. Uh, and uh, so over the time, so we detect the M protein level in the blood of that patient. And uh, so you can see that the M protein, uh, after the treatment, the M protein level drops significantly. Uh, but over the time, uh, in this time, 2016, the March of 2016, uh, this is historical sample. Okay? Uh, so it's the M protein start to pick up again. So we detect the relapse of the M protein of that cancer at that time. But if you look at the, uh, the traditional method, the standard care method, it actually detects the, the relapse of that patient in 2017 uh, in January. So, so we detect that 10 months earlier. Uh, than the standard care. So on another patient that we have tried, that's, uh, uh, that's about, we detect that eight months earlier, okay? So we are at this moment, we are uh, conducting a larger clinical trial study uh, with uh, more than 50 patients, uh, more than 400 uh, blood samples uh, with Princess Margaret Cancer Center. Uh, so it takes a lot of time to get the, uh, the permit to this kind of study. Uh, 
in the future. Um, so the similar, similar technology is not limited on the multiple myeloma itself. It itself is a small disease, but we are targeting a much bigger disease, a cause of a disease, the autoimmune disease, like a rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis and uh, other, other autoimmune diseases. There are two, very many of them, about five to 10% of the population actually have autoimmune diseases. And we are detecting other cancers, hopefully in the future. Um, so, and there are also another application which is interesting. We try to discover new antibody drugs from the patient who recover from the uh, infectious diseases. And at this moment, we are working on malaria uh, disease with the Copenhagen uh, group. They have uh, like the blood of the patients who recovered from malaria, and hopefully we can uh, detect some antibodies that can kill my malaria. Uh, so uh, to summarize, I actually want to emphasize that this protein sequencing is a enabling technology. It's a new technology that can be applied to many, many different areas. Just like DNA sequencing, when they invent it, people don't know what it can be used to. So we can only uh, imagine some of the applications. But once this becomes large scale, high throughput, uh, then uh, scientists of this community will invent new use of it. Uh, that's, that's all, thank you. Are there any questions for Ben? Uh, so I, know, I understood that we have to detect the particular protein uh, to detect the can cancer, and it gets lost in the you know, all the noise. So uh, I was wondering how protein sequencing and mass spectroscopy, how that fits together in finally detecting uh, the cancer. So, um, so, so the, this protein, all the, uh, the traditional method to try to detect some properties of those proteins, right? So, so this uh, M protein, the cancer protein, is very similar to the, to the background noise. Uh, but if you look at the sequence, they are different. So therefore, uh, so you can select a piece of that protein that has a unique uh, molecular weight, okay? So for mass spectrometer, we actually can program the mass spectrometer to only filter in that molecule within that molecular weight. So that I will select only the, the protein, uh, the, the, the fragment from that M protein. So this we will get rid of all the background noise. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So this, uh, for, the, for that uh, myeloma cancer, uh, every patient is, has a different sequence. Uh, so, but the sequence is unique to that cancer, uh, so the patient will bury that sequence for a long period of time. Uh, but for every patient, that sequence is unique. Now, that's why we actually need to sequence that protein for every patient. Um, Yeah, I think, uh, so we don't, well, the, the exact outcome should be, can only be, tell, be told by clinical trials. Right? At this moment, we only suspect that this will significantly uh, you know, cure the patient much, much better. Uh, so that's also what the doctor told us. Right? So, they, uh, so, they, you know, so if use, using the, even using the bone marrow aspiration, so they want to do that very frequently. They want to do that you know, like two, once every two months. So that's, that's the too much burden to the patient. And so they think that even if you, if you want to do it four months, every four months, that's too infrequent. So you won't be able to detect the cancer early. So from that, you can tell that the doctors really want to gain a few months early uh, to treat, treat the patient. Right? So, but the exact outcome you know, can only be done later. Uh. Are there any further questions? So I have a question. Yeah. So both uh, Peaks and now Novor have led to uh, spin-off companies. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is sort of a meta question. What has been the role of the spin-off as a, in the research, in furthering the research or furthering the impact of the research? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's actually uh, very important. So there are different, uh, uh, you know, the company and, uh, and uh, in the, uh, academia, they, they do things differently. In the, let's see that for to gather big data, well, this, this company actually helped a lot in this kind of research and also uh, to, to re really benefit the, the patient. So, uh, uh, for example, for the research, if we, there is no way I can use graduate students to manually sequence 900 uh, proteins uh, 
for me to create the curated data for the machine learning, right? So, but in the company, as long as I pay the employees, I can do that. Right? So that's a, uh, so something that is not doable in a, in a university that can be done in the, in the, in the, in the industry. And also the, uh, so also by the mass spectrum machines, right? so there's uh, probably very hard for me to get a big grant to buy the machine, it's you know, over a million dollars every piece. So, so, but in the industry, we can raise capital and uh, other ways to get the fund. Uh, Okay, thank you very much to Bin and to Jesse and Mu Jun. So thank you, Bin. Thank you. So I, I'd like to conclude this first section of the uh, of our uh, of our day. Um, I, I would like to thank the Graham Trust Foundation for the uh, exceptional research it sponsors. I hope we've seen it. We've seen a sample of this today. I think it's very exciting. It shows an impact. I think in the areas consistent with the goals. Of, of the foundation. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out, but I'd especially like to thank the Graham Trust Board for coming out um, to, to, the, to the second in annual uh, Graham Trust uh, uh, Symposium, and look forward to seeing you all again next year.